121, by the way, I make sure I got it. That's Tuesday, okay, right class. I once came in here to teach the wrong class and somebody let me know. Let me know if that happens. I'm, I've done things like that before. Once students let me go through the whole lecture and then told me it was the wrong class. Don't let that happen. Anyway, um, yes. NDAA? Oh, yes, yes, that's important. Yeah, if you do sign up to your red teamer, you'll of course have to sign a non disclosure agreement. That's normal. If they pay you, then they typically want you to shut up. That seems reasonable. <laughs> anyway, um, so we're going to talk about Mod 7 here. And uh, all right. And I don't know if we need to talk about machine learning in this class. I might replace this with something else. By the way, I think there is some special events coming up you might care about. Today is October 10. And, uh, oh, I thought there was, oh, okay, October 26, there's a talk on Thursday, and on Tuesday, there's an OWASP meetup. Oh, Tuesday, that's rude, I can't go to that. Anyway, all right. There used to be a group called Pacific Hackers, but they don't seem to have any scheduled meetings, so I don't know if they're still operational. Anyway, let's take a look at the, um, the lecture, which is legal stuff. So, Mod 7. Um, all right. All right, so the U.S. legal system. Um, this is stuff I think most of us know from watching cop shows on TV. So the jury is the people who listen. They make all the decisions. The uh, whole principle, which goes, I think, all the way back to the Roman Empire, is that a bunch of individual, bunch of random people are the best people to judge your situation, hopefully because they have a life like yours. So the plaintiff initiates the lawsuit, and the defendant is the person who defends themselves. So this is based on common law. Common law is based on precedent. You find previous cases that are similar to this one, and you argue that that establishes the precedent, and our, this case should be decided to, to be consistent with the previous one. Civil law is very ancient, and civil law is primarily for things that have to do with money that do not send people to jail. So there's three bodies of law, constitutional law, statutory law, and regulatory law. Constitutional law is based on the U.S. Constitution, and that's federal law. And the whole, America, I think, is very different than other nations in that we have powerful states. The original 13 states were very independent and colonized by different European cultures and very different in many ways, and they only agreed to unite against the British on the condition that they could maintain local rule over almost everything and have a very weak federal government that really couldn't do much to the states. And it's still that way. The states can do outrageous things like change the gun laws and the abortion laws and everything, and the next state will do something totally different, um, which is not common in other countries. Our federal government is greatly restricted in what they can do, but the federal, there are some constitutional laws that can overrule the states with great difficulty. As we've seen, the, the Supreme Court has been trying to get Alabama to stop being outrageously racist for over 150 years, and Alabama just keeps doing it over and over, and we have several times had to have federal troops go in by force and force them to do things like let black kids into the white schools, and uh, it, we're pretty close to doing that again. So this is a huge argument in America. Anyway, statutory law is done at the state, state level, various levels, um, from legislature. All right, and then regulatory law is the stuff that Donald Trump and the current Republican Party want to annihilate, and the Supreme Court is helping them do that. This is where you establish a regulatory agency like the Food and Drug Agency or the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Agency, and then they pass rules, like you have to have your food inspected, you can't lie about how much stuff there is in a pot and things like that, and they, the, the argument of the Steve Bannon type right wing is that this is all unconstitutional and you should not be able to have any agency that can pass regulations like the air traffic control agency and all that, you, everything should just be lousy fair. Um, unless the constitution, unless you pass a special law in Congress for everything they do. So the environmental protection agency is one of their big targets. They want to get rid of all environmental protection laws so people can run companies and pollute all they want. And they're having pretty good success getting the Supreme Court to go along with that. The, there's more cases coming up to cut this down more. They've already had great success in ending most gun restrictions in America this way. So anyway, that's currently there's a lot of regulatory law. There's a lot of government agencies that pass rules, and they do not have to have Congress pass a special bill to change those rules. Um, all right, so then they have the court system where this is all enforced. So you've got various local courts, and then you have a lot of appeals courts you can send things up to if you appeal, and ultimately you can appeal things up to the Supreme Court. There's a very small chance that they will hear your case. They hear something like... Uh, 
less than 1% of the cases that try to get there, but they try to pick the cases that they see as very important. And with the now six to three right-wing majority, they've been actually taking completely falsified cases just for the purpose of pushing right-wing things. Like there was a woman who wanted to, they wanted to legalize discrimination against gay people, so they got a woman to pretend that she was going to run a website design company for weddings and that a gay couple might ask her for that, but she in fact didn't have any business making websites and didn't have any gay couple asking to do it. They just made that up and took it to the Supreme Court. This, by the way, is completely unconstitutional. The court is not allowed to examine a fake case or a theoretical case. There's an official Latin term for this. They're only allowed to examine a real case with real people with real damages. But they just did it anyway. They they taking several completely falsified cases. Another one they did was they wanted to legalize uh, forcing students to participate in Christian prayers in schools. So they had a coach in the South who would get his football players to huddle on the team and pray. And they had photographs of him doing this. And they decided it was legal because he did it in privacy and didn't force the students to attend when the exhibits they had showed pictures of this being false. But they don't care. And this, by the way, this is nothing new. They've done plenty of this back in the 20s and 30s too. Uh, at one point, they even ruled in the Sacco and Vanzetti case, they ruled that they were going to execute these communists in America, um, even though they had proven that they were innocent. And they said, well, they might be innocent of this crime, but they're enemies of our way of life, so they get executed. So it's, uh, it's disturbing, but you know, our, our, our court system is greatly revered as more fair than the others, but there are some serious problems with it, and there always have been. And they don't seem to be getting any better. Right now, two of the justice, uh, Supreme Court justices are blatantly taking bribes and have been for 20 years, um, and maybe more of them too. Anyway, um, so these are the appeals courts and the federal courts you can get up to in the Supreme Court at the top, the ultimate jurisdiction of everything, except you can then get a future Supreme Court to cancel out what the previous Supreme Court did, and that's what happened with abortion. In, 19, in the 70s, the Supreme Court legalized abortion at the federal level so no state could outlaw it, and last year, they reversed that after they promised. So they, their Supreme Court is able to ignore their own precedents and overrule it. So uh, that's our system, such as it is. The federal appellate court and district courts. All right. So anyway, um, as a forensic examiner, you don't need to have a very detailed understanding of the layers of the courts. What I did when I you just talked to your lawyer and such. Make sure you note, let lawyers on both sides know what you're doing and you leave the court stuff mostly to the lawyers. Anyway, I'm looking here. Uh, all right, the Federal Constitution Bill of Rights had no bearing on the states, but for the most part, each state had their own constitution. Yes, and states still have their own constitution, but they cannot defy the federal constitution, um, at least when the Supreme Court gets involved and stops them. Although the Supreme Court has no way to enforce their rulings, and Andrew Jackson was the guy that first just completely ignored Supreme Court rulings and said they don't have an army, so forget it. And that's why um, the, there's a big argument about this. The Supreme Court doesn't have any weight unless they command respect. And when they get caught blatantly taking bribes, it lowers their respect. So they're currently uh, considering that they have to do something to improve their image, or people will just start ignoring what they say, like Alabama did until last week. But well, they finally relented and let some black people have votes there that they were uh, washing out with uh, gerrymandering. Anyway, um, all right, so in the courtroom, Here's what goes on. You have jury selection. Then you have oath and preliminary instructions, opening statements, testimony, closing arguments, more instructions. Then the jury retires for deliberations and the issue of verdicts. And then separately, you have sentencing. So the jury is the right to a trial by jury outlined in the Sixth Amendment um, in all criminal prosecutions. This is why Donald Trump was madder than hell last week, because he did not have a jury for his civil trial, because you are not guaranteed a jury for a civil trial, only a criminal one. Um, all right, and so uh, var jury is the process of selecting the jury. That's the Latin term for it. And this is where people ask you questions. When I was there on a jury, they got very upset when I told them I taught hacking. That was my profession. They all freaked out. And it turned out there were three other people there that were also in computer security out of the 18 people selected for the jury. And we had a lively discussion back and forth of, of what, what we're doing and is it illegal and what kind of lunatics are we anyway. And they let me stay on the jury, uh, mostly because they asked me, what do you think of Bradley Manning? Or no, uh, uh, Snowden. And I said, he's got to go to jail. He promised to shut up and he didn't shut up. And they said, that's a good answer. We like that. But anyway, so uh, anyway. 
Uh, that's the process. They, judge, lawyers and judges ask you for biases, and uh, there's different amounts of, of jurors. The reason juries have, you have to be polite to the judge in court and obedient. For example, a lot of people want to get out of jury duty because they just don't want to be bothered, and so they try to claim to be racist when they aren't or something. And um, if you irritate the judge, you get contempt of court. If you do something disrespectful, that's what you get contempt of court, which is really serious. You can spend years in jail for contempt of court. This is what happens to journalists. In America, in America, a wife cannot testify against her husband, and you cannot testify against yourself, But and your priest is being compelled to tell you what you told them in confession. But a journalist has no such protection. So they can take a journalist that had like secret papers and say, who gave you those papers? And if they refuse to answer, they can be hit with contempt of court and locked up for years in prison, and it has happened many times. They do not have any right to not disclose their sources. But if they do, of course, nobody will tell them anything anymore, so they have a strong incentive to do it. But they don't have protection like priests and lawyers would. So it is an issue. Contempt of court is not a small thing. That's why you dress up well and you act polite. Isn't priests and family members? What's that? Uh, priests and family members? Yeah, priests, family members, lawyers, and doctors. I think are the, the only groups I know of that can, can refuse because they have special protection. Um, that's why if you, I've heard, seen it in a lot of movies where you, if someone's trying to tell a lawyer somebody says, wait a minute, pay me a dollar. Okay, now you can tell me because now you're my client and now I won't have to tell anybody. But, uh, but you can't, but a, a journalist that gets like top secret papers given to them by some mole like WikiLeaks has no such protection. So then you have opening statements. Um, the prosecution has the burden of proof. Everybody is innocent until proven guilty. So you don't have to defend yourself at all. You, if they can't prove that you did it, you win. And so they go. Um, they have to prove guilt. Under the Fifth Amendment, you do not need to speak at all. You have the right to remain silent. Um, and so, um, and as Trump did, you can just plead the Fifth for every question they ask and not tell them anything if you want to. Um, so direct examination is asking your own witness, cross-examination is the other side, asking the same witness to try to get them to contradict themselves or refute what they said. So deliberations, after you hear all the evidence, is when the jury goes into a room privately and they consider the case. Um, and they discuss it there um, and uh, then they make a decision. Uh, you get a hung jury if they can't come to a unanimous decision. Uh, this is why many political Analysts I listen to say there's no chance for Trump getting convicted of any criminal courses because all it has to do is one of his supporters has to get on the jury. And that's it. That will make a hungry jury. You have to have a unanimous agreement of guilt, and 30 or 40 percent of America likes him, so it's very likely that some of his supporters will be on the court, on the jury. Anyway, um, all right. So that's your criminal charges are initiated by the government. So if there's something like a murder, the government will prosecute you. Even if there is no surviving family member to complain or anything, the government will regard that as a crime against the state. And that's a felony is a serious crime. Misdemeanor is a less serious crime. Uh, deposition is what you often do instead of testifying in court. They often agree to let you just record a deposition with a lawyer where you make a statement that's played in court. Um, I don't really know what the rules are for that. I think just whatever the judge likes. One famous deposition was uh, Steve, um, Bill Gates. When Microsoft got sued in 2008 to break them up for antitrust, Bill Gates recorded a deposition that was fabulously terrible. He lied, he contradicted himself, he made blatant stupid statements and it hurt him very badly. Um, it, because Microsoft, had carefully conspired to modify Microsoft Office to make sure it would crash when running under a competing product called DRDOS. And they put this in writing in emails. Let's just put in features that will cause that other operating system to crash and that will get rid of it and then people will buy our MS-DOS. And he just tried to lie about that in court and that didn't help him much. Anyway, um, all right, so civil trial is disputes over money and if you lose, you have to pay money. Nobody typically goes to jail. It's, also, it's therefore a much lower burden of proof. A criminal trial, you must prove beyond any reasonable doubt. A civil trial, you just have to prove to the preponderance of the evidence, which just means more likely than not, like 51% chance. Um, all right, and so uh, that's the game here, all right. And so the, am the amendments are what limits us largely here. The First Amendment is the big one. Um, you have freedom of speech. 
It doesn't mean you can say anything. You can't like tell somebody, I'll pay you $1,000 if you go kill that guy. That's not covered by freedom of speech. That's um, inciting a crime. But most of the time, you have freedom of speech from the government. However, an individual company like Twitter can just kick you off, and that's not violating your First Amendment because they aren't the government. A private company can restrict you any way they like. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah. Right, so if you go to, yeah. What's if, I, if I put a bug in my software, why should I be uh, like, uh, sued? Because if you put a bug, you mean a spying device? I mean, what the bug is it? Oh, well, what he did. Well, that's not a violation of free speech. What that is, is an abuse of monopoly power. Yeah, but it's a private company, right? It is a private company, they but. Yeah, they're sued for, by the Federal Trade Commission for abuse of monopoly power. That's a, and if you are a big, powerful company and you crush your enemies with your popularity, that is illegal under trade law. And that's, the, that's that administrative stuff that the right wants to get rid of. That's, um, the Federal Trade Commission has anti-monopoly laws. Yeah, but that doesn't make sense. I mean, they can do whatever they want, right? Well, there's a point when they actually get punished. It's very yeah. rare. Microsoft yeah. actually got punished. Right now, they're trying to punish Google and Facebook, and it's not going very well, and Amazon, but all of them, see, Bill Gates said the real lesson he learned from this is that he hadn't paid enough bribes. He didn't put it, he said, I haven't contributed enough money to political campaigns. So um, now all the tech companies do contribute money to political campaigns on both sides, and they have lobbyists in Washington taking people out to parties and stuff, so they have people that are their friends. They bribe people. And you just have to accept as the cost of doing business that you bribe legislators to protect you, and now there's somebody to protect you. And this is extremely effective, and it's why there has been no significant regulation of any of the tech companies, and there probably won't be. Logically, from the written law, they should all be broken up. They're all monopolies, but, um, but they're pretty good at defending themselves right now. That's why, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders really want to break them up. Yeah. Well, the, the legislators buy stocks with insider knowledge yeah. and get away with it, yes. Insider. Yes, because they know they're going to pass laws and they hear a secret deposition, hear secret information, and then they trade stocks. Um, Nancy Pelosi did that a lot. They all do that. They regard it as a perk of the job. And uh, a few of the more idealistic ones like AOC are trying to stop it, but there's not much momentum to stop it. So I, there's corruption in every system. <laughs> and... Uh, that's part of the corruption in our system. Anyway, um, uh, okay, Ellsberg Shrink made sure notes for protect. That's right. He was a doctor. Yeah, his psych a psychiatrist also is allowed to not answer questions about the patients. All right, these are good, uh, good issues. All right, so anyway, um, the Fourth Amendment is the one that probably most directly affects uh, forensic examiners. You can't just search through people's stuff to find evidence of a crime. You have to have probable cause and a judge sign a search warrant, and then you can only search what the warrant lets you search, um, because the idea is if the government could just kick in your door and search for your stuff, they'd probably find some crime everywhere. And uh, so this is the one that really matters. If you do exceed your rights in taking the evidence, then you can't use it in court. It becomes inadmissible. And this is a big issue for forensic examiners. Um, you have to have evidence that was obtained legally. This is why, for example, vigilantes. There's a guy that just got killed a couple weeks ago because he was a catch of rear predator vigilante. He would go online and pretend to be a small child and wait for a man to want to have sex with him and then meet with him and then like take pictures of him and humiliate him and turn him into the cops and everything. The cops say, we hate this, don't do it, because not only are you going to get killed, which he did, but also, the evidence you gather is not admissible in court because you don't know what you're doing. You're just an idiot messing around with this stuff. Leave it to the cops to investigate crimes. They would much rather have that. But anyway, um, so that's the issue. You have to be careful how you collect evidence or it won't be admissible in court. So the exclusionary rule will remove evidence seized with examined without a warrant or in violation of your rights. And fruit of the poisonous tree is the issue. If you steal evidence illegally, and that evidence leads you to like another witness or another whole bank account somewhere, you can't use any of that either. That's fruit of the poisonous tree. It's evidence you wouldn't have found except for the other part that you got illegally. Um, then there's, um, you can have an order made by a higher court that directs a lower court to send them documents, and there's a motion in limine, which is what a lawyer poses, files this to request you to suppress evidence. This is a big deal in a lot of famous cases. Uh, for example, you will be tried for a crime and you committed like a similar crime before. 
and the prosecution wants to bring that in, and your learning will say that has nothing to do with it, the fact that I was accused of committing that previous crime is not relevant, and they will argue. But you submit a motion in limine suppressing that information, which is why jury trials are very strange. And often the jury is told not to read the newspaper, not to watch TV, because they don't have all the information. They have only the information that passes these tests. Not necessarily all the information you could learn by reading the paper, but only the legal information. So even if there's information that makes them seem very guilty, but it was not obtained legally, the jury doesn't get to see it. And they have to decide based on only what passes the test. So it is sort of like a theatrical exercise, not as simple as just trying to find the truth by any means possible. So that's search warrants, the most important part for us. You must obtain a search warrant authorizing you to examine the evidence if you're working for the police. Of course, most people do not work for the police, they work for private companies, and then you just examine the company and you don't need any warrants or anything for that. You will examine the company's computers, the company's videotapes and all that is company property. All right, um, but if you are working for the police, you have to demonstrate probable cause and get a judge to sign a search warrant, which will then say you're only allowed to look at this stuff for this purpose. It limits what you're allowed to seize and examine. Uh, so that's why I mentioned before, I think, if you do an examination of a Windows disk image, the first thing you do is go into the registry and look for the USB store key because that lists all the USB devices that have ever been connected to that computer, is what my, one of my expert trainers told me. The first thing you do is look there because then you tell your client to write another search warrant and look for this hard drive and this thumb drive and this thumb drive because that probably has evidence on it too. And only I can only tell you what they are after examining this. So. That was always his first stop. Then while I spend days hunting through the hard drive, they're off getting the judge to sign the search warrant to seize those other devices too. All right, you can do some searches without a search warrant. There are some exceptions. The Patriot Act gave law enforcement huge powers to just seize things without a search warrant if they're related to terrorism. Um, and you can also do it if you agree to it. If, some, if they ask you, can I search this, and you agree, then you don't need a search warrant. And if there's an emergency, that's exigent circumstances, like if somebody has been kidnapped and they're dying somewhere, you're allowed to ignore search warrants and just barge into houses and take stuff. Um, so there are, that's, um, there's also the plain view doctrine. If they're allowed to see something that is out in plain view, um, like something just lying on the front lawn, lying on a sidewalk, they don't need a search warrant for anything that's in plain view. They only need a search warrant for something where you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, all right. So a plain error is a major mistake made. And even if there is no objection made by the attorney, which there should have been, you can have a um, new trial ordered or an appeal based on that. There are rules. Um, all right. And you can conduct a warrantless search after an arrest has been made under certain conditions. I'm not quite sure what those conditions are. And standing is a huge issue. Uh, standing is your right to object to a Fourth Amendment search. And standing, by the way, is what the Supreme Court absolutely violated in that case uh, where it's legal to discriminate against gay people. That's what I mean. You don't have standing unless you have an actual defendant, an actual plaintiff who has a complaint that they really got hurt and they're demanding some relief. You can't just make up something theoretical. You can do that in Congress when you're passing a law. But in going in court, you are supposed to have somebody with standing. You have to have somebody who can show they have been injured by this. This was a big deal with uh, Biden's attempt to forgive student loan debt. He wanted to just forgive all the student loan debt. And the Biden administration said a month before that, we can't do it. Only Congress can do that. But then they asked their attorneys. And they said, well, we don't have the power to do it, but nobody will have standing to complain about it. So you can just do it, and they won't be able to reverse you in court. And so they tried it, and they tried to reverse it in court, and so a a loan agency tried to claim that they made money from the interest payments on student debt loans and the government forbidding students' debt was hurting their business in a state. They tried to claim that they had been harmed by this because they said nobody's getting harmed by this. And that was the argument. And I don't know, I think they managed to limit it based on that. But that's the issue of standing. You can't bring something to court unless somebody is a victim who can claim that they have been injured and they deserve some relief. You can't just make up a theoretical thing. There has to be a real person with a real issue. <laughs> anyway, um, 
All right, and here's another one that comes up a lot. When is digital surveillance a search? There are a whole bunch of things law enforcement does to gather evidence that may or may not be legal. Like you can, inter you can wiretap a phone call, but that's because of the Kalia law. The phone company is required to let you listen on phone calls. So they have special equipment at the phone company, and when you give them a court order, they will tap the phone and you can hear what people are saying. But cell phones are a problem. And so what they do to interrupt, intercept cell phones is they drive a truck into your neighborhood, they put up a fake cell phone tower, they broadcast a strong signal, all the cell phones for several blocks around will route through that tower, they then downgrade the protocol down to something like GSM-2 so they can crack the encryption, and now they can hear everything everybody's saying. Now there is no way to restrict it to only the one phone they're supposed to be spying on. So they say, well, we'll ignore all the others except for this one, but we really collect the data from all the others, which is how a lot of it works. Anyway, that's Stingrays, and there are arguments about this, about whether it's okay or not. Now, the one is GPS tracking devices. They can stick a little box on your car and record everywhere it goes. Now, is that an illegal search or not? Do they need a warrant for that or not? The police departments have tried to say they don't need a warrant because they could have just had a cop following you everywhere, and it's just a way of saving money. Other people say that's ridiculous. You can't afford to do that. You're doing this all over the place. I, don't, I think it varies on the state and varies. I think it's not that clear at all yet. To what extent this is legal? Another one that come up very recently in the last couple of weeks, um, private companies in America know everything everybody's doing because of the apps on your phone. They know everywhere you go, uh, every purchase you make, everything because of all the apps on your phone. And that data is sold and resold to advertisers all over the place. And police departments have been saying, why can't we use that? And they have been buying it for years. The FBI, the NSA, and the federal and police agencies have been buying that data and using it. And there are huge arguments over whether that's legal. Um, it's really not clear. Um, but anyway, uh, so there's one of the commands here saying, monitoring signals do not invade any legitimate expectation of privacy, and therefore there is neither search nor seizure. That's one argument. The undercarriage is part of the car's exterior, and as such is not afforded a reasonable expectation of privacy. So there are some statements that have been made trying to figure out whether attaching these devices to your car is an unreasonable search or not. And then there's traffic stops. If they stop you in a traffic stop, can they demand your phone and scan the data on your phone? People have been trying to do this, and they now have ruled in 2014 that they do need a warrant to do that. Stopping you for a traffic stop is not enough evidence to read your phone. Although, going through an airport to another country is. They can seize your phone and demand to look at it, and your, and your computer and everything else. So a lot of security conscious experts have said you should not transport any confidential data, like company data, across through the airplanes. You should put it somewhere in the cloud and go through with no computer and download it at the other end. Um, all right, then the Fifth Amendment says you can't incriminate, be forced to incriminate yourself. All right, and um, this comes up in computer forensics because if you get a phone and you don't have the pin, you can ask the person for the pin and they can refuse to answer. And the Fifth Amendment means they're allowed to not answer. They can claim that it might incriminate me, so I'm not going to give you the pin. But if you need a thumbprint or a facial scan, they do not have any right to refuse to provide that because that is not speech. And the Fifth Amendment only says you cannot be forced to testify against yourself, and your face and your thumbprint are not testimony. So that's why the privacy experts say you really should have a password and not biometrics if you want to be protected against the U.S. government searching your stuff. All right, and the Sixth Amendment is something about a speedy and public trial and not directly relevant to us. But here's other laws that matter to us a lot. The Wiretap Law Act, like I said. Um, this limp means it's a huge crime if you do. Um, you can set up, by the way, your own Stingray. You can just buy the equipment. You can set up your own cell phone tower to track signals. You can wiretap cell phone traffic very easily. You can do it with a $30 USB dongle on your phone, but it is a huge crime if you do it. You're violating the Wiretap Act, which is really ruthless. Um, all right. And uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act also says it counts uh, transmissions from a computer. And the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act um, is trying to protect us from international espionage. Here's the Federal Wiretap Act limiting what you can do there. But the main act that comes up for computer pen testers and everybody is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. This is the main one. Uh, this is a law that is actually very unfortunate. It was written a long time ago in the early days of the internet. So it was originally intended only to protect national security data on computers or really important stuff like what we would now call critical national infrastructure. But the way they wrote it, they said if a computer is being used for um, interstate business, 
then it's protected. And that means any computer that can be viewed, like a web server that can be seen from more than one state, which is all of them. So it turns out every server everywhere is now covered by this, which was not the original intent. So if you hack into any server, you're violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. In fact, even if you just right click and look at view source on a web page and you find a vulnerability there, you have violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act because you now know something that the author of the web page did not intend for you to know. You can, now, if you have a good lawyer, you could probably get out of that on the grounds of fair use, but you could also make a case that that's violating it. This is the problem. Um, just being smart can appear to be illegal because you noticed something that they didn't want you to notice. But anyway, in reality, if you are not a lunatic and you get a lawyer and you work with your lawyer, uh, it's okay to do things like that, but what's not okay is to scan it and find, brute force the passwords and get on and all that stuff, and that's what the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act ends up punishing. Let me check for comments here. Um, websites that track what politicians are trading, yeah, like they were saying. Yep, we already track your, yep, that's right. All right, good. Anyway, um, let me see if I can get back to the right browser and the right tab. All right, there's other um, provisions covering computer trespass and distributing passwords and so on, and damage to a computer too, which would apply to the attacks that just bring down a server. Um, and then CALEA, which I mentioned, is the law enforcement which requires the telephone companies to let law enforcement wiretap phones. There is no such law for internet traffic, for like email and Skype. Um, they would like there to be, but there is not, just for telephones. And the Patriot Act, after 9-11, gave great power to law enforcement to uh, ignore pretty much all these rules and just gather data to prevent terrorist attacks, just like we're probably going to see in Israel now. If you have a major attack and your intelligence failed, they usually pass laws giving your intelligence much more power to gather data in the hopes of not letting this happen again. So they have a lot of authorities under the Patriot Act. And as came out in court hearings, um, there are two Patriot Acts. General Alexander talked about this. There's the public Patriot Act that the public knows, and there's a private Patriot Act, which Keith Alexander, the head of the NSA, advocated, which is his interpretation. And he said, rather than just do what is clearly legal, what we're going to do is everything right up to where we're sure it's very illegal, because we're really trying to stop those terrorists. So we have a secret interpretation of the Patriot Act, which means we can do any damn thing we want. <laughs> and that's what we really restrict our activities by. And this is why we have an increasingly hostile American cyber team. Uh, back in the time of Obama, the United States had not admitted ever hacking anybody. And Obama admitted that we were hacking other countries. And then the legal basis, which by our military attacks other nations, was increased and uh, became more and more actively aggressive in cyberspace all along. Um, and the legal framework was developed to permit that. And now, of course, it's a free for all. Every nation is hacking everybody right and left. Um, but there are limits to it to some extent. Also, there's a big deal to end the exploitation of children. It's used a top law enforcement priority before 9-11 was innocent images on child exploitation on the internet. And it's still a huge crime to possess or create child pornography and a big law enforcement priority. Um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998 made it possible to do business on the internet. Before that, you could not be held liable for any contracts you signed on the internet because only a contract signed with a pen on a piece of paper counted. So you couldn't really do much loans or business on the internet, but now you can. And this also means that you cannot, um, it is a crime to violate copyright by making like unauthorized copies of MP3s or, or textbooks or anything like that. It's all covered in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, all right. And then, so here's some rules for evidence admissibility. The Fry test says that the Expert opinion must be derived and based on science that is demonstrable and not experimental. This is why you cannot use astrology or lie detectors or things like that in court because they are not accepted science. This is why fiber analysis, where they look at like threads and figure out what was going on, has now been removed. It was a standard in law enforcement, but about six months ago they issued that it was too unreliable and it's no longer going to be acceptable in court. Fiber, what does it mean? Uh, where they find like a uh, fiber on the ground like threads and then they try to determine what code it came from to prove who was there. I think that's what it was. It was either that or hair. I think it was fiber. This was a common thing. They would go into like a hotel room and vacuum up the carpet and find fibers and then they'd say, you were there because these fibers matched the fibers on your jacket. And apparently, what's that? 
Yeah, the problem is it's not that perfect like DNA. The fibers aren't really that distinct. I think that's the issue. They, they used this for years, but they recently declared it's not considered scientific enough, and they're not allowed to use it anymore. Um, it might be hair, though. I can't remember if it was fiber or hair, which is a similar thing where they get little hairs. But anyway, the Daubert test is another one where you must do benchmark testing on your hardware and software tools so you're reliable enough. And there's federal rules of evidence talking about uh, the scientific basis for forensic evidence. So, like I mentioned, an expert witness is a special person in court. Most people in court, if they are testifying, they can only testify to what they saw firsthand. They can't testify to what somebody told them except to say, they told me that. That doesn't mean it happened. They just say, well, he told me that. That's true, maybe that he told you that, but that doesn't mean it's true. But the expert witness is allowed to have an opinion that matters. They're allowed to say, I examined this computer, and in my expert opinion, I determined that this was done on that computer. Even though nobody saw that thing happen on the computer, I'm able to deduce that they did this act at this time. And then the weight of that evidence is based on their estimate of your expertise in court, whether you really seem competent and have good degrees and stuff. So that's the game. Both defense and prosecution use their own expert witness, and they cross-examine each other's expert witness to try to prove that the other guy is doing it wrong uh, and discredit it. All right, so uh, here's the stuff you'll have in your report that you turn in, a complete statement of all the opinions and the basis for them. This will be a written report that goes with your expert witness. The facts or data exhibits your qualifications, a list of all your publications in the last 10 years, a list of all the other cases you've testified in recently and how much money you're being paid. Um, all this thing has to be there in your document, which is your forensic report, and then you testify. So it is both the contents of your report and the persuasiveness of your presentation in court that matters. So you have to dress up right, look good, be clear in your answers, and so on. Um, that's what makes you an effective expert witness. Uh, yeah, here we are. I found some random fibers in a hotel room. That's right. Well, yeah. Well, you know, there's a while when they thought um, they thought that these fibers analysis was so great that they really could tell your fibers are different than everybody else's fibers. But apparently they decided uh, they don't believe that anymore. All right. Um, you know, if it was DNA, they could tell. But fibers are not as good as DNA, I think. All right. And so... Uh, had to provide the information of the witnesses, designation of witnesses, identification of documents, and so on. And there's, um, you can, there can be objections to these things. There's federal rules of evidence, and there's hearsay rule. If, um, that's why I say you can only talk about what you saw directly. If you try to say what somebody told me happened, that's hearsay, and is much less effective in court. All right, so best evidence is where you bring in the actual object. This is the gun that was used. This is the computer that was used. Uh, secondary evidence is like a copy of it, and that's typically inadmissible. Um, although digital evidence, you're allowed to use a copy because you can prove the copy is reliable. So uh, uh, people get a defense counsel, even if they can't pay for one, and can we get the modern regulations? As I mentioned, the United States' ability to regulate tech companies is very weak, but Europe is not. Europe is very strong on regulating things. The European Union passed the uh, European Privacy Law, coming up down here, GDPR, which greatly restricts what companies can do. And this year, several new laws went into effect requiring companies to disclose the algorithms they use to choose that they're showing you and other things, applying to the big companies like Amazon. And California has a privacy act based on the European GDPR, which limits what you can do with California um, uh, data. And um, it gives you things like the right to remove your data from the internet and a right to request data from all these companies and know what they have about you and they have to tell you. So uh, only California has that so far in America, but it will probably spread through America. And it all starts with the EU. The EU passes these laws and all the companies have to change their practices to comply with the EU laws or pull out. And they have threatened to pull out of the European Union and other countries, but not over privacy laws. Uh, they, to, they threatened to pull out of the UK if they outlaw encryption, which they seriously tried to do, and in fact still do apparently have on the books, that they can demand plain text of everything so you can't use any good encryption, but they've decided not to enforce it yet. Um, Facebook has said if they enforce that, they will pull out of the country. So we'll see how, what happens there. So anyway, the European Union has strong data privacy laws, which we very much do not have in America. Like I said, they can just take all the information they gather from your cell phone and just sell it and reuse it and resell it to everybody. There's no, that's not, there's no law protecting your privacy of that data. You can also collect data in America 
for one purpose and then just change your mind and use it for a different purpose without telling the customer. You can't do that in Europe. You have to tell them why you're collecting the data and you have to use it for only that purpose. And you cannot use it for some other purpose without getting permission from them again to use it for the other purpose. So it greatly degrades the financial underpinning of internet companies, which primarily make their money by snooping on your data in America. Um, that's why they restricted this very greatly. Uh, they, they fought the GDPR quite a bit, but it's there now. Um, and like I say, the law enforcement has this big issue of going dark. Uh, if the companies can't collect and retain data, then you may not be find it so easy to find out everything people are doing by subpoenaing companies. So they call that the going dark problem. Um, all right. How important are an expert witness's formal degrees? Very important. Uh, my, my instructor told me, now that you've taken this course, you'll be able to say this. When they ask you, have you had formal training in forensics, you can say yes. So you do have, that matters. Now, it's not legally required, like you have to do it, but it impresses people. Having more degrees, having more papers, having more experience, you just have a thick resume. And if you have like a big thick resume of stuff and the other guy has got nothing, then that will make them count this person more. But your presentation and what clothes you wear and how confident you sound also matters. So, you know, it's, a, it's not as simple as one thing being everything, but degrees are important. Um, this guy tried to get Spokio on white pages to remove your data. No joy. Well, yeah, I think you'd be hosed uh, unless you're in California after California's regulation went in effect, and I don't know how strong it is, or in Europe. Uh, it's interesting, yes. And I, it also might just be ignoring the law. It's not, the law is new, and it's not clear how much effect it's really going to have. Anyway, um, all right, so GDPR, uh, to more details how GDPR works. And, of course, in China, they claim they have the greatest restriction on Internet content. Of course, they have the great firewall of China. So they greatly restrict what Internet you can use there, what company you can reach. And also, um, the Chinese government knows everything and uh, is spying on everything everybody does with great, uh, to a great extent there. And in India, I think it's also, uh, they're doing an awful lot of spying on their citizens now, especially under Modi. They're moving in the same direction. Although I don't think they have anything like the Great Firewall. I don't think they restrict Indians' access to the internet very much yet. But, um, oh, I think yeah. Stuff is banned in India, TikTok. What's that? Stuff is banned in India. Stuff is banned? Yeah, TikTok. TikTok is banned, oh. And actually, how can they enforce that? That's why I wonder, can they block it? Because normally, um, for example, you can't block anything in America because there's 100 different ISPs. In order to nationally block something, you'd have to have a national ISP and make everybody use it, like they do in China. I mean, they can just uh, enforce all the ISPs to do that. Right, but they might have a law, but then you can violate with a VPN or something. And uh, yeah. in Russia, they're going to block all VPNs in April of next year, and they're going to also require Earlier next year in Russia, they're going to require everyone to record the real name of everybody who puts a post on a social network or anything and keep records of that. So, you know, this is something Putin wanted for a long time, and apparently he's now passed it through. They're going to ban them in April of next year. They've announced it. They're going to ban VPNs. They really want a computer. Putin has said for more than a decade, everything should have a real name on it so I know who's doing everything. That would stop all the crime on the Internet. It's probably true. It probably would. Might have some other consequences, but it probably would. Anyway, all right, let me check uh, for any more comments in Twitch. Um, all right, I'm going to stop the recording here.